How are you? How are you? Hey, 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 you see I haven't even met you yet. Hello, How are you? Good. 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 Good.
having reasonable studies. I online, I've talked to a lot of folks, and I've heard them, whether that be on Facebook or even on next door, that people think that it's, it's real obvious for them to be able to take that that link the studies and go up from uh, only up to uh, 155 and step them to 675 so that you can surround traffic because all of us have been in traffic know that's really tough, especially when you see that we have a lot of freight that's coming up from I-16 and SNAP. But we have to study it and make sure that it's not just a one-time fix. This county is a commercial hub on, for supply freight logistics. We don't know it. We sit in traffic and we see it coming up on our railways. But we have to make sure that the funding that's in place will remain in place. And that's really been uh, a very key focus when we go in the session is to making sure that while Henry County grows, we already see it, it's a quarter million people. But we want to make sure that for every step of the way that we have the data to back that up so that the money stays. Because too often we've seen when you can't justify the expense, that excess time from that money actually gets clawed back and our county is left to put the bill. I don't believe that's right, but that's why we have to make sure that we have it is feasible and to make sure too that other options are if they're better for local citizens that we explore those before we get that type of funding directly into creating a solution that's better for making sure everyone can move around the county. Thank you. All right, Mr. Rucker. First of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to Henry County Chamber of Congress for allowing me to be here today. So I think what we need to do, we need to have more meetings with the Georgia DOT. And I think those meetings need to include um, local municipalities, and I think it needs to include shareholders, which you got. So you can discuss upcoming projects, we can discuss funding, we can get feedback, uh, things of that nature. Um, What's happening is that some of these projects are taking a lot, a little too long. That's what I see in the next door. People are tired of tire construction. There needs to be more holistic surveys done so that we can uh, analyze and assess better means of transportation, you know, more resources of uh, transportation. And they may, that may include commuter passenger rail. Um, we need to definitely analyze those. Yeah, if you're looking at commuter passenger rail, you're talking about 5,200 cars off the road daily. That's, that's, that's pretty significant, all right? Um, if we, if we, if the project is on the level, trust the way that maybe it's time for us to get out of the truck. Uh, so we need to look at that. So. All right, thank you. Uh, Will you repeat the question just so I can answer all aspects? Yes, the, the managed truck lanes are mentioned as a solution to the gridlock on 75. However, it is believed that ending them at 155 may simply add to the congestion on 75. You will extend them to 675 help. Is it possible and is it achievable? I do think that it's something that would help. I don't, I could see there being an issue if we stop it at 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 a, at a point the road, um, mostly because our state highways haven't been expanded, and I think when we talk about transportation, we have to think about more of an all-inclusive plan. So when I say that, we've got to look at 81, we've got to look at 42, we've got to look at 155, and you know, if we only do the the transportation project at Bethlehem Road, and we don't have the only lanes going all the way down. To 675, you know, those trains are going to be getting off in like a trove and going on 42, and then we have everybody sitting there. Um, so I do think they are something that should extend. I hope that is what the survey says when it's done. Um, but similar to how Representative Polly answered, it, it is something that we have to work together on, whether that's county or state or federal level. We've got to make sure that the funding is available and um, Without, without overextending the citizens here. Um, and so it, it's something that is um, something that just everybody has to be involved in, regardless of the political party. So. All right, thank you. Um, you have a minute rebuttal. Um, Mr. Rucker? 
Yes, so once again, I think it's imperative that we uh, invest in other options of transportation to ensure our, our citizens have the best quality of life. Because to be honest with you, traffic is basically coming to becoming a quality of life. You get off work, um, you're looking to enjoy the amenities of your, city, of your cities, and you're spending hours, sometimes two hours, in traffic. So we definitely need to look at other means of the other transportation resources with those surveys. Um, also, uh, I go back to the commuter rail. Um, it is an option that would allow some senior citizens to go visit their family members for a low rate that would allow some veterans, homeless veterans who can't make their appointment, disabled people, allow them to get their appointments, and also would allow some of our children that will be into college, allow them to transfer back and forth. So um, the surveys are, are needed. I think uh, my job as a representative, we make sure that I secure those, that funding so they can get down to the municipalities so that the people you have elected can assess where your transportation projects need to go so that it can reduce your commute time. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move to Mr. Harris. Yeah, there we go. Uh, hi everybody, my name is William Harris. I'm running for District 74, which is, covers Hampton. Uh, which infamously does not have any bit of 74 through it. Um, and so the unfortunate reality is that um, I would, we would have to rely on service, right? We'd have to rely on studies, traffic engineering, like the whole school. Uh, and it's important that we listen to the experts with this. Uh, in terms of echoing uh, Mr. Rucker, uh, we can't just keep adding one more link. One more lane, one more lane, one more lane. It doesn't work, especially whenever you're in the second fastest growing county in the state. And Georgia is already one of the fastest growing states in the country. Uh, we need further investment beyond just lane extensions. We need further investments beyond just uh, adding an extra lane, uh, especially whenever we're experiencing exponential growth. Uh, and so, yeah, we're secure the DTOP funding uh, and we rely on the uh, surveys from the traffic engineer. Thank you. Um, I'm Karen Mathiak and I represent right now District 73, which will be 74. And like Mr. Harris said, that encompasses Hampton and Henry. As I think about um, traffic patterning, I know that um, 155 has always been on the top of the radar. Um, Representative Holly, I can agree with you more when we have all these studies and we and our committees are looking at traffic patterns and businesses. I, I think that it's um, just have to move a little quicker, especially in Henry County with all the businesses, all the logistics that we have here, it's, it's become almost dangerous and dangerous. I understand that our uh, sheriff had a rough time getting down 155 to an incident just recently. And that makes me look at things quicker. Um, and yes, I think that we have to look at the funding, and I think DOT has um, has some ideas. Um, we just have to get them nailed down and brought to the south side of Atlanta. All right, thank you, Mr. Harris. One I'm okay. minute, Are you? All right, Mr. Williams. <clears throat> Is it on? Is it okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the part of 75 coming up, and I live I live in Milledgeville, so this is a little little different. And sometimes I will come up 75 and like everyone else, get in the traffic backup. When I leave the Capitol, I've been serving as a chef. When I would leave the Capitol, I would get in the express lane. Thank goodness that has reached a lot, but it's not enough. But the more and more traffic coming into the board, going around, more and more uh, <clears throat> ships coming into the board. We've got to access roads. We've got to expand the rail system to get more 
right off the highway and into the rail system is what I really believe. We're going to have to do something with the trucks. The trucks are a vital part, and we've got to look and not just be reactive, but DOT has got to step up. And I think we all agree DOT has reacted a lot through the years. They've now been proactive. The boy ahead of DOT, Van Smith, is presented to Van Smith. It's the only way to fix Atlanta was to do a tunnel under Atlanta. <laughs> and, you know, if we laugh, but that might be the only way that we can fix it. Uh, I, I concur. Henry County is growing so fast. And just uh, every time I come up, there's new warehouses being built. And that's going to mean more trucks, more traffic. But we've got to be careful and do some really hard planning. Um, and I watched GDOT go in and want to do these roundabouts in the middle of a little town and screw up the town. They need to be out here addressing the issues with 75. 75 and get those trucks on more lanes. Like you said, we can't keep doing one lane, one lane. Uh, they need to go ahead and widen it and get the trucks away from the cars. The safety uh, that we all have seen happen, the accidents of people in those trucks, little cars and those trucks don't mix very well. But um, I do hope that we can get that expanded and it does need to be expanded to get four truck lanes. Up to that's 675. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Strickland. All right, we're good. Good evening. I'm Brian Strickland, State Senator, District 17. I've served in the district for the past five years, and the five years before that, I served as a house member for District 111, which is also Henry County. <laughs> Um, everything's been said is, is correct for the most part, in my opinion. Um, directly answer your question, yes, it would. I think the question really was, will it be better if we go all the way to 675? Yes, I think we should go all the way to 675. There's two things that are important about these truck lines for us. One is making sure that it ties into the new Bethlehem interchange. That is very, very important. Interchange is a secret to getting a lot of these trucks off 155 and off 42. And also utilizing a rail that we also have that runs east of 75. That is very, very important. Uh, and lots of leaders in this room, also people sitting up here that work for years to make sure that's a priority. We can't lose track of that. Second part of this is we try to go beyond that. If we just dump them out at 155, then it's going to cause more issues for us. It's really missing a big opportunity in Henry County. When it comes to the studies, Yes, studies have to be done, but let's not make that an excuse to continue to study some for another decade. When the common sense tells us it should be happening, and we've got to figure out how to deal with the managed lanes that come into play at that point. And that's part of what DOT has said. You have managed lanes that aren't using all the property there. And those lanes were something thought about years ago. And uh, we've seen now since COVID in particular, traffic patterns changed. And as we all know from personal experience, unless you catch it the right way, it doesn't always make sense to have those lanes operating as we're operating right now. And so we should have a serious discussion about whether or not we want to continue to have those lanes there um, and add truck lanes when the 65, let the trucks step all to the um, to the to, to the interstate up there to go around 25, or possibly get rid of the lanes and have truck lanes instead to go through the county. That's a hard discussion that we should have. And um, Representative Holly and I were at a meeting a month and a half ago with county leaders with DOT leaders in the head of DOT state, and that was a session we had that day. And I know since then, our three commissioners have moved forward, I believe, with a with funding a study to directly look at that issue, which is important. So I uh, appreciate everything that's been said up here. It's just only I'll add is let's just not continue to study, 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 and put this off. Let's actually get started on this. Thank you. Can you hear me now? All right, so um, our next question, and I'm going to start here and go in reverse now. Um, next question is, Henry County, along with the state of Georgia, 
has rebounded strongly from the pandemic. The economy looks strong despite concerns over the recession and inflation. Unfortunately, however, many of our local employers are struggling to fill available jobs required to keep their operations going. What are some solutions that you have to assist local employers? First off, I'll say we would not have the economy we have in Georgia right now if it wasn't for what we've done the last couple of years in the state. If you look at what's happened nationally, if you look at what's happened in other states, just New York or California, there's two different ways we've approached things since 2020. There's the idea of just shutting everything down, having people in charge and government tell you what to do with your business, what to do with your life. There's the idea of letting you make your own decisions, using some common sense. And as a result, we're seeing record revenues in Georgia. We're seeing more jobs than ever coming to Georgia. We're seeing the effects of national compensation that we're all feeling. But it could be a lot worse when have this issue, which are hire people and we had different policies. And so it's first and foremost that we should not go backwards. We should not elect Stacey Abrams as governor, in my opinion. We should keep the people in charge that are in charge right now and keep the approach we've had over the last two years. Um, something else we can do in addition to that, something we did this past year, we passed an apprenticeship program in Georgia. I paid the bill, tenant. We got to the house. My colleagues supported that bill as well. We can continue to look at other ways of educating young people and adults that want to go back to the job as well. And one of the things that we could do is need to fund some of the technical school, something else again that this delegation has worked together in the past to do, the chamber supported, having other ways to get people trained here in their own communities for the jobs of the 20th century. But an apprenticeship program, as we finally passed this year, is also now going to leverage federal dollars matched to state dollars. To have it where employers looking for people to work can actually use this program and connect with people that want to get trained on the job and get paid while they're doing it and build a career for somebody at that time. That's the 21st century way of education. And that's what we have to focus on here in Georgia. We have to be different. We can't have the model we had when I graduated high school 20 years ago now. I'll say it in ways recently. I was 20 years since I graduated high school. Um, at that time, the idea still was go and either you know go get a four year degree somewhere. Where maybe it would be on that. You gotta go to college right now. You gotta get in debt and um, start trying to pay off student loans. And we have to look at other ways of educating people now, young people now. I love what we're doing with our school system, what we're doing through our state with having high school kids come out of high school, sometimes with a degree or halfway to a degree, and going towards a career at that point. And the apprenticeship program is a great way to do that. Too. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Gas and groceries. I saw some figures just a couple of days ago that we're spending $450 more a month now than we were just a couple of years ago for the same goods. $450 a month. Georgia's economy keeps growing and inflation keeps going. We're bringing more jobs, thank goodness to the leadership of the conservative House and the conservative Senate and the governor, we are bringing more and more jobs to Georgia. Georgia is still number one state to do business, still growing, still bringing jobs. Um, just four years ago, I passed a bill that extended Hope Scholarship for someone who graduated from high school, went into the military, and stayed 20 years and 30 years, get out of the military, and they're still young, they still want to work, they still want to contribute to society. They want to start another program. They may have been in radar repair in the Navy. What are they going to do in civilian life of radar repair? What they can do is hope was extended for these people who were in the military. They now had seven years from the time they got out of the military to get an education, to get training, to get another job and to contribute to society and do something else. You know, as growing up, you know, I, I'm a funeral director. That's what I've done all my life. But I've had other thoughts, just like other people, that I might like to be a uh, pilot or an airline pilot or if you fly a prop duster. Well, part of what Brian talked about, some trippers talked about, is the programs that we have seen enacted through these trade schools down in Eastman, Georgia. 
is the second business airport in the state of Georgia. They have the flights to go down there and they teach jet pilots. They teach people how to fly. So these are more of the programs in education that we're making available and that you're seeing here in Georgia that we're being the leader of and making these things available. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't agree with the senators more. I think that our education system has changed dramatically. And when we look at college and careers at the high school level, and we watch what some of these um, students are doing to get ahead, like Senator Strickland said, he actually graduated from high school with a, with a two-year degree. It's possible. Um, I just spent some time at Southern Crescent Spalding, and I think that we have spent some money to upgrade some of the um, uh, careers in welding mechanics. I think we've done very well in the airline industry. Spent some time at um, the airport at Atlanta Motor Speedway, and I was shocked at how many um, businesses are out there that aren't that need more employees. So I think education is one of our, our keys right now. And um, the other caveat to those, those education pieces is it sure helps us as parents when our, our kids are moving on to, to college, whether it's a major university. But I think all of us have um, supported our technical colleges very well, and, and we want to continue to do that. Um, as Rick mentioned about the military, we also passed some bills that allows our military people that are coming back to our communities that their spouses seamlessly take their degrees and their licensure is easy for them to, to be licensed in, in the state of Georgia. There was a little bit of a lag time there and I think that we fixed that so our military we will um, continue to attract our military folks. Thank you. Before I begin, uh, in regards to kind of like staffing concerns at the local business. Yes. <clears throat> uh, uh, so this is actually my favorite subject. So I actually graduated from military with a uh, degree, you know, in business administration. I really love subject economics, so this is one of my passions. And through this, I, I actually asked a question. It's a good economy for who, right? For whom? Um, Whenever we're talking about staffing, we're talking about like, well, we can't find workers, right? Well, Georgia is in like one of the lowest unemployment rates that has ever been in recent history. Uh, we're at pre-COVID levels. Uh, and so why aren't people, quote unquote, why aren't people working, right? Well, we already know it's a fine demand issue. Uh, whenever we're talking about uh, my generation millennials, we're talking about the most, the most economically disadvantaged generation since the founding of the country. Uh, this is economic statistics. They basically uh, study the opportunities of each economic opportunities of each uh, generation. Millennials are the worst. Uh, our minimum wage uh, is still stuck at seven dollars and twenty-five cents at the federal level. It's even lower at Georgia, five dollars and some change. Minimum wage has not uh, been higher than uh, 1968, whenever it was equivalent to about thirteen dollars an hour in purchasing power. And so what we're finding is that this what we're finding in like this post-COVID reality, as you mentioned earlier, uh, record profits, right? We're at record revenues. So why aren't we paying our workers more? Uh, we've heard the expression, a happy cow is happy though, right? And so whenever we start to talk about why aren't employees happy, why aren't they staying in these jobs? We just need to start paying them more. Legislatively, we do this by increasing our minimum wage. Other states have done it, it's time for us to do it. Whenever we increase our minimum wage, we actually increase our global economy. Think about how much money we're actually losing each year because our citizens aren't going out to our local restaurants. They're not going out hiring local servicemen. They're not hiring a handyman. They're not going out to Home Depot or Lowe's or anything like that to get their home uh, improvement costs, right? They're not going out and spending their money because they don't have the money. They don't have the money because we have companies which are experiencing record problems. This is a 50 year high record that we're experiencing as a country right now, uh, where our wages are at record lows. Uh, 
We can't talk about inflation. We can't talk about a 40 year inflation high without also talking about a 50 year high in corporate profits. At the end of the day, we need to pay people more so then we won't run into staffing issues. Uh, whenever you pay $15 plus an hour, there are no staffing issues. People will stop buying up and work for you. They're going to pay more. Uh, people will sign up and work for you. And so that's my recommendation. That's how we can do the legislative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this year, we actually increased in the governor pushed the $5,000, um, um, what's the word again? $5,000 increase for law enforcement and teachers. So I, I kind of disagree with you. I think that we have increased um, pay wages. I know that through, again, through our technical schools, these students are coming out making nice money, nice money, with very little experience. I, and I realize that a lot of our um, craftsmen are having a rough time finding extra help. For me, I need some things done to my office right now. I have a great friend that is a craftsman, and I've had to wait what, about six weeks for him to have enough time to put me on his list. So I think that the jobs are there. I think that we are paying. Um, I'm not sure who's paying $5 an hour. I think even the restaurants are making more than that. Um, most of the restaurants, you can wait to get in to them. I guess that's my time, I think. So when I think about economic development and what we can do for our local businesses, I think I think we have to look at a holistic approach. And when I say that, we have to look at our students from the time that they enter school. Um, so that's K through 12 education. It starts there. If we're if our kids have you know terrible literacy rates, we're not setting them up for future success. And so I always want to start there because I, I think that that is the basic tenant of what we have to do. Um, we have to look at what we're doing in education. But, you know, one of the things we don't do very well in K-12 is we don't have financial literacy. We don't teach them how to balance a check. We don't teach them, you know, what a loan means. So, you know, right now, nationally, there's a lot of talk about student loan repayment and whether or not those should be forgiven. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and advocate one way or the other. But what I do recognize is as the cost of education continues to rise year after year, you know, you are putting students that are coming out of college in a disadvantage that you mentioned, millennials being the most disadvantaged group of people um, in the sense of uh, economic prosperity. And so if we're going to go with that, you know, we have to, we have to look at why we're we're coming out of college with so much debt, you know, are we pursuing degrees that don't pay well? Um, and if that's the case, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if the answer is, you know, your loan corresponds to what your average salary would be. You know, maybe that's something we should look at. I don't, I don't know, but I do know that, you know, as long as we're, as long as we're bickering over, over that, um, we're not, we're not really coming up with solutions. And so, you know, we have Southern Crescent in the area that's something all of them have mentioned and that's that's a really um great asset for our community and we have to make sure that is you know funded well and that our kids coming out of there are paired for the jobs but we also another thing we can do locally and at the state level is to bring in companies that are good for jobs. so you know you see it with hyundai and rivian those are two companies that have are going to bring tremendous economic prosperity in our state and those people are going to have their jobs and they go and they're going to eat at our local restaurants and they're going to you know spend their money at local stores and so that that, that is something that we can look at in terms of what to do um, but also you know one of the things people complain about in our district is warehouses and one of the things i think we should do and we have done is move more towards manufacturing and so, you know, this talk of minimum wage, um, I, I don't know anybody that, that hires people for $7.50 an hour, but um, most people refuse to work for that. So I think that's kind of a null and void point to bring up. But, 
nonetheless, I, I think that, you know, when you're creating good quality jobs, those people are going to get paid more. That's my time. Thank you. Mr. Walker? Okay, um, first thing we need to do is we definitely need to increase the minimum wage. Uh, I, I heard Mr. Strickland and Sam talk about uh, companies are paying well above that. But that House Bill 116 is still on the books, I believe, that hasn't been passed, and that's to increase the minimum wage. So we need to get that done. Uh, also, we need to uh, allow small businesses to leverage for government contracts, especially those that are owned by veterans. I'm a veteran myself, uh, and women, uh, and also disabled, disabled veterans. We need to do that. Uh, second, we need to bring quality jobs. So I appreciate the comment by Mr. Strickland and uh, Ms. Daniel about the training that students receive in college and in high school. I'm a big proponent for that, but we can't say that they need to be trained on a technical job and not advocate bringing those jobs here. Um, I also agree that there are two sites that we have. We have Rivian and we have Hyundai. Why not let those kids that are coming out of college, why don't let them build these factories that go into these vehicles? Um, next, we need to, just like my point, we can't speak about the 40 or 50 year high in inflation and not speak about the money that corporations are receiving on top of that, all right? Um, we have to ensure that we pass bill legislation to make sure that these, co these corporations that we provide government subsidies to, that they are paying our people a little, a, a little wage. All right, Mr. Holland. All right, thank you. It's because we're in the stands, right? Great start. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and then. <clears throat> so, that question actually brings up uh, some of the most uncomfortable truths about our county and its growth. While we are one of the fastest growing counties in the state and in the nation, uh, we realize that not only is it, is it troubling for some who are graduating our high schools to be able to compete in the world, to be able to provide themselves with a living at many of these businesses that are having a hard time hiring them. But there's also another truth that a lot of us know. Um, we, could, we can talk to the families around our community who actually are unhoused, they're not in homes. They're living in tents in the woods around our communities because they know that affordable housing is tough. And when affordable housing is tough, it's because people actually can't afford to make a living with the jobs that are here. The County Chamber of Commerce, you all know this as fellow members, new members, you've seen people who could not go and actually pay for the houses with the jobs that are there. And so what happened? Sometimes a really bad situation causes people to be inventive about their circumstances and say, you know what, maybe instead of going to get a paycheck from somebody, I can work for myself. We've seen a rise in small businesses through this area. This is an opportunity for us to make sure that we're having those relationships with our students. So we put businesses with them. We do that with their apprenticeships, as my colleagues have said. We found a way to make sure that apprenticeships are paid for through technical colleges. But something that I also agree with is I very much support those unions that have helped to build up our country all those years. History, because not only are you teaching these kids skills to allow them to be employable, but you have a guaranteed job. Which and I and I talked to Dr. Irvin Clark at Southern Crescent Tech. Excellent. Uh, he's an excellent leader for that school. But we know that when it comes time for people to be able to pay into this economy, they have to be able to make sure that they have a job there and that they have certifiable skills. So I want to see that grow because this county is growing and we're seeing with opportunities. But we can't get lost on the fact that, yes, we need to make sure that those who are taking the jobs are not only able to keep them, that both we provide a robust economy because people have the skills for those businesses that need to stay afloat in our town. And uh, if we do that, I think we'll grow. All right, thank you so much.
Um, the last question that we have, um, and we'll start back with you, um, Mr. Holly, come back this way. And um, it's the Atlanta Motor Speedway has proposed a gaming and entertainment complex on their property that would be an economic boom in Henry County and surrounding areas. The chamber has supported placing casino gambling on the ballot for Georgia voters to decide. What do you see the chances of that happening in the next year or two? It's an excellent question. I remember speaking to uh, Brandon Hutchinson before him at Clark at the Atlanta Motor Speedway about that. You know, we look at, we even have some of our colleagues here directly from the Hampton area. Uh, and my district for the last four years has covered parts of unincorporated Hampton that can see the benefit of that. Uh, we know that if you bring casino in, at a minimum, you're looking at about a $1.25 billion investment and about 5,000 jobs in the area for those citizens, as well as enough local money being brought in to be able to expand roadways so that you don't have clogged traffic. So we already know what it looks like not just on, on seat day, we know a lot of local parents have to get there to make sure they can watch their children graduate from our state. So there's a lot of money there. Uh, I believe that it's always better to have the citizens make the decision rather than have politicians make it for them. And I know that that's something that I know local residents I've talked to say, no, I don't want you to, I don't want you to vote for me. I want to vote on this. Give me the chance to vote on it. And I think that that's something that we have to value. But I've also heard the other side, that people have wondered, what about gambling addictions? Well, according to Yale, uh, Yale Medical Study, they looked and said that literally 1% of all Americans have, have gambling addictions. And I believe that if this is something that we're going to study, because again, as you all know, whenever you spend millions of dollars into a program, you have to study it. Right, you have to cover your assets. <laughs> we have to make sure that funding is available. Now, the good, side, the good part is this I can tell you this for our colleagues in the House Senate, together, we passed House Bill 1013 to make sure that we have mental health parity so that if you are having gambling addictions or mental health issues that you need to see a counselor, your insurance company has to pay for it. The same they would do it if it was a, a medical price otherwise. So we have funding in our budget for mental health care. I would like to see it expanded to help our law enforcement officials, but that's separate. But what we have to do is make sure we give this as both to the local people, make the people decide it, not politicians, but you decide it. And as well, we need to make sure if that money is made available and if it actually goes to camera then those who find themselves most vulnerable to a gambling addiction, they would provide enough money in there so that they get the help that they need. All right, thank you. Mr. Rucker? Okay, well, I didn't expect any gambling on here, but I do have, I have been late. So I think it's great. I'm glad it's, it's going on the ballot. I think it can bring um, increased revenue to, to our district. But more importantly, um, once it goes, and you people vote on it, I think there should be a meeting with you citizens in to determine the layout and the makeup of how this casino is going. In particular, every, I'm a business major, so every corporation has something called corporate social responsibility. When we start getting all these warehouses and these organizations up, they are specifically in their bylaws, they are specifically supposed to, like, kind of like a Hippocratic oath, do no harm to your citizens, all right? So we need to be at those meetings so we can say, hey, you're going to build your casino here. These roads right here need some work on. Or if you're going to build your casino, how about give us some funding so that we can make sure that baseball fields and football fields are covered for our high school. So I'm glad that, that it's on the ballot. But if they, are, they want to come here, then we need to make sure that we are there and we make sure it's a partnership and not them dictating what they're going to do with us. Thank you, so this is an issue that has been in the legislature for a while, um, and I think, I think it is important to talk about, um, and I think it's something that ha does have the potential to bring some economic growth to our state. I um, also see how people might have hesitations about it, and so because of that, because the opinions on it are so 
um, I don't want to use the word volatile, but because they're so diametrically opposed at times, I do think that one of the things we can do as representatives is allow people to decide. And, you know, with that being said, um, there, there's, I mean, there's a lot of good things that can come from it. And I think extension of the host scholarship would be one of those things. Um, and so that's, that's obviously a pro to it. Um, but I, in terms of answering you on, on how likely it is to get done, I, I can't answer that honestly. And one of the things that I said from the beginning is that I would never give somebody a bald answer just to provide an answer. Um, obviously, we are one of 180 people out there. And so I don't think anybody at this table would really be willing to say yes or no, that it would for sure end up on the ballot this year. But I do think it's something that enough people have brought up for long enough that you know, it's something that we should definitely consider. Mr. Rucker, do you need a minute? No. All right. Mr. Harris. Uh, uh, in regards to, you know, I, I love everything that was said earlier. If it were up to me, uh, we would have this industry vote on everything. Um, the unfortunate reality is, like, uh, all of this, we're expected to represent 60,000 people. How possible is that, right? Where we can't go and get everybody's opinion. And so, this is a perfect way to do it. In terms of likelihood, um, yeah, again, I'm not sure. Uh, in terms of our formal opinion, uh, I'm okay with the government not necessarily regulating ice. Uh, we do need to be responsible with things such as gambling addictions, but we also see a lot of uh, communities with uh, casinos where what they do is that they invest into those communities, and they also invest into neighboring communities as well. And so this casino, not necessarily just Hampton, but this casino could also invest in communities such as Griffin. It can invest with which, you know, if you move a little bit south, if you go one county south, we're talking about a community to where the median income is half. Um, compared to here or pay it. Um, and so with something like a casino, which again, I don't necessarily believe that vice such as gambling is inherently moral, um, we could find very strategic investments into our local communities, including like our local police departments, our local education, our parks and recreation departments, and stuff like that. And what does that mean for us, right, in this community? This means that we're going to have other people come in from out of state, and we're going to talk about traffic, of course, um, but they're going to be paying for our children's schools. They're going to be paying for parks. They're going to be paying for generally what this local community would need or otherwise be uh, property tax for, right? They're going to take a lot of that tax burden away from us just by the nature of it being, you know, and by the nature of how other casinos around the country have operated. Personally, I'm okay with it. But yeah, absolutely. Just let the citizenry decide. Uh, more importantly, the citizenry here, because it's our community, right? Uh, and it's something that we have to make sure that we're okay with. Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think that the citizens of our state need to um, make that decision. I don't think it should be 180 or 54 people that make the decision. This topic has been um, the topic of major conversation for a number of years. Um, as we look at destination resorts, is what we want to call it, to put some, some um, bows around the idea, I think that we do need to look at the whole concept. The other piece that I would like you to realize is it's not just the state, that, or it wouldn't just be on the ballot, it would also, wherever the the casinos may be placed. Hampton is being looked at very, um, very deeply. The citizens of Hampton would have a second bite at that to make, make that vote too. So it sounds great. I think that um, there's a whole lot there that we have to consider. I think that um, we've even talked about some of the proceeds going for medical assistance for our state. I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. But at the end of the day, I think that our citizens need to be, be very engaged in how that looks like and how it how it's voted on. All right, Mr. Williams. Thank you. 
I've, I've been in the House of Representatives now for six years. Four years ago, um, we had a committee that started looking at the destination resorts. We travel all over the state. We held hearings, held hearings at the Capitol. First of all, we can't decide. It's going to take a constitutional amendment. It's going to have to go on the ballot for y'all to vote whether or not a destination resort can come to the state of Georgia. Then, if it were to pass, then it's up to the individual counties. If they wish to put it on their ballot, they don't have to. It's going to be up to the individual counties. The other factor is how many. We should talk maybe three, maybe four. One around the Savannah, Valdosta area, South Georgia. One metro area. But it's going to bring a lot of traffic. Yeah, I've seen the plans of the destination resort there at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Gosh, they have the room, they have the infrastructure. They have a lot to offer to put that. But there again, the holdup has been negotiations between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans want the money, the revenue, to go toward medical care. All of us need medical care. The Democrats have been held up. They want at need scholarship. And what does that tell you? What we're dealing with is college tuition. People have gone to college. They've built up these loans and they can't pay it back. How many people are going to go to college just? because it's being paid for to get them something to do. They'll never get a job. They'll go to college for the rest of their life. Uh, I don't know that we can afford lifetime students even with the destination resource. I mean, but uh, there again, that's been the whole thing. Now, I'm, I'm not a better, but I do know sports betting is going on right now. They're betting on the next pitch. If this is going to be a strike or a ball, it's going offshore. Sports betting is something that needs to be looked at probably before uh, destination resorts. Uh, it's like I say, it's taking place now. They're betting on every pitch. They're bet betting whether or not it's going to be a strike or a ball. He's going to strike out or he's going to get a hit. Uh, the Young people are wanting it, and a lot of that is taking place. So again, it's going to take a lot of lot of negotiations. Well, I, I think as um, Rick was saying, the, the whole has been this is a two part issue. One, are we going to amend our constitution to allow this? That requires a two thirds vote of both chambers. And then it goes to the citizens for a vote to approve that. And so we have not had a consensus. The House is really all about where the money's going to go. The Senate's kind of fought more about whether we're going to start with it. So we're going to hold up and get to this vote. I'm taking a, a little bit of different position since day one on this. Um, I think it's important that we pass the enabling legislation at the same time we pass a constitutional amendment. What I mean by that is we're going to send it out for the voters to decide whether or not you want to amend your constitution to allow casino gambling, yet we're not going to tell you how we're going to do it. The enabling legislation will talk about how many licenses there are going to be for casinos, how big they're going to be, where they're going to be located, where the zones are going to be. And what I've seen in the 10 years now since I first ran for the House has been discussed, and I keep hearing different things from, at one point, almost every single lobbyist was hired by somebody from Las Vegas, and they all had different ideas. And they're coming to us, and finally they came to us in Hampton and said, we're going to build this right here in Hampton. Just pass this amendment. I said, that sounds great. Well, let's pass a legislation that makes you build it there, right? We can do that. We can pass it together. And so I don't, no offense to any of my colleagues, I don't think it's as simple as saying just let you vote. I think we're short selling on that. If we're going to do this, we should do it right. And we should pass enabling legislation that makes sense, set this up. We're too big for three big companies, don't get monopolies, and just build a big casino in Atlanta, one in Savannah, one somewhere around the border. 
and actually have some competition where they're competing with each other and building world-class facilities around our state if communities want that. Um, and we should tell you what you're voting on and send it to you. So that's, that's a position that I've had. And I'd be willing to support amending our constitution to allow casino gambling if we do it right with an annual legislation at the same time. Thank you very much. Um, Y'all talked quickly. <laughs> it's time. Um, so, I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak. Um, you get three minutes each. Just a closing statement, anything that you would like to talk about. And we'll start with you, um, Mr. Holly. Go down. I was saying, if I pass the mic. <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to come over here a little bit. Um, it's been an awesome four years. Uh, I'm really grateful to God for allowing me to be able to be here to work, to try to help people really see that there's an opportunity to get a government that is responsive to the um, as most of my colleagues know, as most many of you know in this room, uh, I don't sit on a big high horse and big hill. You can't reach me. You know, you know I'm very accessible. And that's accessible not only through uh, this rough pandemic, you know, where we saw that families were in need and we got to it. And whether we're going down low school or up here at Alexandra Park, McDonough, or Stockbridge and doing but uh, being able to feed 17,000 families in this community uh, and getting the help of corporations as well as a unique partnership of businesses and law enforcement communities throughout this county, but also going even further than that. And that means being accessible, you find your know, TikTok, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, not to even have a YouTube channel. On next door, having daily conversations. Yes, you get to have a conversation with your state representative. And it's about making sure that you can actually serve people. Uh, it's not about having a big fancy title. There's a whole lot of folks around county that have no idea what we do. I'm going to tell you this as well. I'm a Democrat. And I realize that the Democrats are in the minority in the House. But here's something else. When you vote a sin, we don't have the excuse to come back to you and say, well, we can't do anything because we're not in power. I have to work with my Republican colleagues and get some of my Democrat colleagues on where we may disagree. And that's why you won't hear it on your local news that we actually have about 3,000 bills introduced when we're in session, and about 1,500 of them became law. It won't appear on the news. You know why? Because it's a whole lot easier looking at Republicans and Democrats choking each other out. We live in a society that has so far been able to successfully promote the idea that Americans can't work together. But that's a lie. 80%, did you hear me? 80, 80% of the legislation we passed, the Republicans and Democrats, we actually have to vote in favor of it together. And I know that's very different from the society that many of us want to see. We want to see is this divided. But the truth is, is that I enjoy serving you because I'm able to listen to all sides and we're able to actually push through measures that help everyday people without all the trauma. My name is Elma D. Holly, and I would love to serve you again at this time in House District 116. It's always tough to follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, first, Thank you, Henry County Chamber of Commerce, for inviting me. Thank you to the citizens for uh, being here today, especially the, the gentlemen in the room. We got Monday Night Ball out the way, so it's very important that this was today on Tuesday, so I appreciate you guys coming. Uh, my name is Demetrius Rucker. Um, my only motivation for running for House District 117 is to represent you people and to represent this community. Uh, I've been a service oriented person since I raised my right hand to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies for domestic. Um, it's a great thing. Um, I have no allegiance. My only allegiance is to the people sitting in this in this room. Um, I have no political amb ambitions. I have no personal ambitions. Um, 
I am uh, solely here for you. Um, I am a very candid person. And as I get out there, you start talking to me, you're going to get the truth out of my mouth, all right? As I, as I look and I hear people talking, they say we, we're missing leadership and we're missing candor at our local level. I have leadership and candor. I've done that for over 25 years in the military. Um, I will begin by saying that I am not a politician. I'm a neighbor. I'm a father. I'm a veteran. And I am your next servant leader. Thank you. All right, so I have a little bit of a wild streak, and I don't like to follow people, so I refuse to stand. <laughs> um, but my name is Lauren Daniel. I am running for the 117th as well, and I am truly seeking to serve the community where I grew up. This is I literally live five minutes down the road from the house I grew up in, and it's it is personal to me. Like these people that I and trying to represent are the people that you know, watched me in elementary school when I was at Unity Grove or when I graduated and and like it's it is it is it is different I think when you know the people personally that you're trying to help it it, is, it takes away similar to what they were saying the idea of this title and that you're not responsive or available um, because you already know them, you're your neighbors. And so that is that is my my goal is to be accessible and to bring some solutions to the problems that you have. Um, my background is in marketing and communication and focused in business development. And so uh, I have three young children. I obviously have invested in our community and I've chosen to raise my kids here. And regardless of the change that we've seen and you know growth that we've seen, I think that we have to make smart decisions to make sure that it is somewhere that we want to live, raise our family and work. And so I think that's, you know, that's what we're all trying to do essentially. Um, and my husband and I have actively been involved in local politics for the better part of a decade. And so I do think I, in some ways, I'm uniquely qualified to advocate on y'all's behalf because of the relationships that I do have, whether that's, you know, the capital, the, the governor's office, through, you know, people like Senator Strickland down here or, you know, even somebody at GDEC, I you know, have relationships with these people because I have made the effort for the last decade to know who they are and to bring them, you know, our issues regardless of whether or not I was even in office. And so uh, that's something that I do think is important. And I also um, found out yesterday that I am endorsed by the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. And so that's something I'm, I'm really excited about. I think it's um, a testament to, to what I'm trying to do. And so I, that's, I would love to have your vote this November. Uh, again, my name is Lauren Daniel. I'm running for 117. It holds all of Locust Grove, parts of McDonough, and the north of Spalding County. My name is William Harrisy. I'm running for uh, House District 74. Uh, I ran in uh, 2020. Uh, at the time, it was for 73. Uh, so it's pretty much the exact same uh, district. I in terms of Henry County, uh, it's just going to pretty much cover Hampton. Uh, I was born in Atlanta, lived in Griffin my entire life, and I currently live in Bayville. So I've lived in this district for my entire life. Um, I've seen the development grow, I've seen how explosive uh, the development has grown in Henry County alone. I remember at the racetrack whenever it was just a Wendy's. So I've been here for a little bit, right? Um, I've been here, and you know, of course, other people have been here a little bit more than me. I'm <laughs> four years old. Uh, but I do represent the millennial uh, generation. Uh, we're starting to take this time now. Um, yeah, we're 30% of the population, about 35% of the elected positions uh, within our uh, state and local governments. And so what we're doing is that we're starting to see a change for that now. We're ushering in a new generation of political change because at the end of the day, the state of Georgia is for me and my children to inherit, right? This is something that's very vital for me. This is the reason why I'm running to be a representative for House District 74. It's because I know for a fact that we can actually come through and make new change based on common sense, but more importantly, based on actual scientific data so that we can actually justify our decisions. We're going to represent you. And I hope that I can uh, earn your vote uh, this November. I make myself perfectly available as well. I'm just like uh, Representative um, Holly, 
for if you go to my website at representativeofthepeople.com, which I love my branding, by the way, uh, you can actually click a little button and you, it will call my personal cell phone. Number. And so I make myself perfectly available to everyone as well. Anyone can uh, contact me, email me. And honestly, um, ever since I went to this for myself, I have a little bit of free time. So if you just want a conversation about anything, let me know because I can talk and talk and talk. Um, thank you. I uh, look forward to your support. Again, that's uh, District 74, William Harris, and representative of the people.com. First of all, thank you everybody for coming tonight. It's always a pleasure to be able to, to have this conversation, have a conversation with you. I'm Karen May and I bring you now District 73, like I said. Um, it does include Hampton, um, Spalding County, and a, a big piece of Fayette County now, Woolsey, Brooks, piece of Peachtree City, and the county itself. So, the reason that I ran to begin with was my my colleague before me had been there for a minute. And as I watched what he did within our community, I didn't see a lot of the South Side attention. So that was the reason that I originally ran. When I finally got elected, I, I really saw what was happening within our communities. I do want to represent people and represent you as my friend and as my neighbor. So that's, that in this community means a lot to each one of us, just like it does to you. We want to have safe, a safe community. We want education for our children. I think that it takes people that, that will take the time to listen, to be available, and to, to move forward for everything that we can do for the South Side of Atlanta. I think it's so important for us as a community. Um, I also think about healthcare. I'm a chiropractor by trade. So I think about what, what is happening with our healthcare within our, within our state. And we've worked hard to with um, the Mental Health Parity Act. I think it was a long time coming and I'm so proud of that. Um, as we move forward within the state of Georgia, I look for some great things to happen for us because we have been conservative. We have had um, great leadership that have kept us open and have kept us moving forward. And I hope that I will be able to continue to represent you in District 74. And my cell phone numbers on just about everything that you will get from me. So just like everybody else, I think that that's very important for us to be available to you. We stay here. I think we're kind of speaking to the to the choir here, but it still amazes me when people call me up and say, "Well, are you in town this week, or are you in Washington?" <laughs> that speaks pretty loudly of who we are as state representatives. So that's another thing that I try that I think all of us try to do is help our help our constituents understand what our responsibilities are and what we really do at the state level. So again, I hope I can earn your, your vote. Hi, yeah. uh, I'm um, <laughs> Rick Williams, I live in Villageville. Uh, I'm running for State Senate District 25. This is the seat that Burke Jones held before he runs, ran for Lieutenant Governor. This district, this seat covers Baldwin, Putnam, Jones, Jasper, but a portion of Henry and a portion of Bill. It covers a lot of territory. My father is actually from Butts County, and all of my ancestors were Butts County, and a lot of them were from Henry County. Uh, I'm in the funeral business. I've spent a lifetime of caring and taking care of people and serving people. I've served as a county commissioner, uh, did that for one term, and I was chief registrar for 16 years. So I did voting, very familiar with voting. I've served on the election integrity committee in the house. Um, and I've served as a state representative for six years. I'm not running for this because I need a job. I don't need a job. 
My family owns three funeral homes, two cemeteries, monument business. Thank goodness my sons are there running the business, so I get to play. I get to serve people. I want to thank all of you for running. I know what it takes. Uh, I know that I spend three months, January through March, in Atlanta. I know I make $17,000 doing this. I spend $12,000 on rent. Uh, the other goes for gas and groceries. So do I do this? I do it because I have a service heart. I do this to help people. We don't just go to Atlanta and pass bills. We do constituent services. We do help you when you have an issue with unemployment with the Department of Labor. Everybody's had a problem with the Department of Labor. Uh, other state agencies, that's what we're here for. We're here for you. My cell number on everything that I put up, people know where to reach me. I return calls. That's, that's something I've always done. As the gentleman on the end said, the Democrats and the Republicans work together in the state legislature. 80 to 90 percent of the time we vote the same way on most issues. Most issues affect all of you. It comes down to one or two very different issues that we will vote party lines. But at the end of the day, we love each other. We a brotherhood. We want to do the right thing for you and make life better for everyone in the state, great state of Georgia. And I want to thank you for giving us your evening and coming and listening to us. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Amen. <laughs> you do some funerals as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, first off, again, Thank you to my current colleagues that I serve with and everyone that's also running. It's an honor to be up here with y'all tonight. I think we all want the same things. Um, sometimes disagree about how we get there, but we all want what's best for our community, for our state. So when I ran uh, 10 years ago, the first time I was all of us, um, I was a kid that just graduated law school and moved back to Henry County where I grew up. I wasn't that far out of Henry County High School when I graduated high school. I was single at the time. And the last two years, I've gotten married and bought a house here in, in McDonough. And now we have two little boys, a four-year-old and two-year-old. So my perspective, to be honest, obviously has changed in the last decade because of my family situation. Just growing up a lot during that time as well. But what I said then still remains um, my driving force to why I continue to run for office. I think we're crazy, all of us who want to do this right. You mentioned the money side of things and the sacrifice that it takes. But when I first ran 10 years ago, I said, you know, if I'm being honest, I'm not really a political activist type. I don't always just do whatever a political party says. I've um, stood alone against my own party on things, and I've stood in the trenches against the other party on things. Um, so I don't always do what is politically the right thing at time, sometimes. Um, I have a passion for wanting to serve this community. I grew up here and um, watched. A lot of things go to the north side of the clear. A lot of the attention to go to other communities. And when I ran, I said, I want to go up there and I want to build relationships at the state capitol that will benefit my community. I want to build relationships with the governor's office and other statewide offices so we get more attention on our side of town. And that's what I fought for for the last 10 years. And I believe we've accomplished a lot. But we have a lot more to do because we have a lot of new challenges that have popped up the last couple of years that weren't there 10 years ago. Good example, tomorrow morning, this question did get asked about Mike. Um, the number one issue I'm hearing right now in my community deals with trains. Deals with what we're dealing with. It's, it's related to the truck lanes as well and the interchange, but uh, the issue we're having with train traffic we're going through right now and stopping um, on our tracks. So tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'll be meeting at a particular spot in McDonough with the head of DOT, the main director of DOT, um, one of the top people in our account. And one of the top people we're going to pull up, we're going to train together, we're going to ride that track together. But we're going to talk about what states should be doing to support West and Henry County as we deal with the issues of the rail. And I don't say that to say I've got all the answers, but what I hope, and I think all of us hope, is we get ourselves in a position of being in those meetings and be your voice in those meetings.
it's five for us next week. So I'd be honored to get your support one more time. i uh, love to serve two more years as your um, state senator here in Henry County. And thank you so much to the chamber for putting this event on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, Mr. Casey Morgan, um, show up just a few minutes ago, and we're going to let you uh, do a three-minute uh, statement as well. And um, he won't come up here, so you can be on camera. Good evening. How y'all doing? Good evening. How y'all doing? You know, my name's Casey Moore. I'm from Madison, Georgia. Um, retired military service member of uh, 20 years, three months, just enough to get what it needed to be. And it been in God's plan. I went a little bit farther, but it wasn't for entries. But I, I thank God for being able to serve this country. Amen. And I'll say, amen, it's a habit of mine. And one reason I'm late getting here today, and other than having trouble finding this, <laughs> um, I made a promise to three people that I was stopping, I would listen to what they had to say before I came up here. And I did, and I stopped, and I listened to three young ladies who were being evicted from their homes. And we got a company coming in called Robin, coming into Wharton County, Newton County, and Walton County, Robin, Ray, and it's causing the, the, the rent issues and it. people rent houses and stuff too. You meant to be doubled. And all three of those young ladies were meant to be and they got a notice within the last 10 days of a double song. And if they can't pay it, they want to move the house where they go. And everywhere around them, it's about the same thing. It's getting the same way. Economic growth is good. Trust me, I, I want to see Georgia grow just like everybody else, but if you grow up on one end, but you cut the roots on the other end, you got trouble. Now, I made a promise, and I told them I would bring it up. I mean, I'm not state senator, I'm not county commission, I'm not any of those things. I'm a man of God and I believe in every people. And what I'm in a loose election is really not important to me at this point, but it's important to help people. And this particular man, I pray to God he keeps his mind. I, I know he has over the years. I, I don't know him like a person, but we need to look at people and their. Uh, that by my number, I mean, if you own um, a fixed income and somebody doubles your rent, that's nothing you can do. Nothing. Except be homeless. When I registered to, to, to get in this race, I was so disappointed because I had been to the Capitol since I was in, in, in probably third or fourth grade. And I came into the Capitol and I saw all those texts in the back street with people homeless. That's how in the world can we have this many tents in the back of the Capitol and the bedrock of Georgia's foundation right here. Homeless people at, at the Capitol, I couldn't believe it. And they have been a lot of stuff that I'm clear. But, but transportation, economic growth, education were the three key points of this discussion. All three are important. Uh, I think you have one guy have enough to be honest with you. But we have to look at people first and try to help each other. I mean, if you don't help each other, then you cannot grow up in a good. If you don't help each other, education is good. Lord, God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, the questions did come from those who registered. And um, so thank you for those questions as well. And um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>